Our major concern has been that small children, some as young as five when they start school, have actually had homosexuality thrust at them. There has been a promotional exercise on very young children indeed. I'm just going to say... Oh, here we go. No, but if you're going to write a book about two gay fathers for five-year-olds, oh, oh, I think that's wrong. Oh, 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 oh. You are terrible! It's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. <laughs> So I watched It's a Sin, and I didn't like it. And I really didn't like that I didn't like it, so I need to talk about it. Hello, my name is Mage, and welcome to Black and White Thinking. For those that don't already know, It's a Sin is a British show by Russell T Davies that recently aired on Channel 4 in the United Kingdom and HBO in the United States. It's a show following the ups and downs of five friends, one woman and four gay men, in London set to the backdrop of the 1980s British AIDS crisis. The tale is loosely based on the experiences of Davies and his friends in their 20s. Russell T Davies, for those that don't know him, is the creator of shows like Queer as Folk UK and the Doctor Who reboot. The man definitely did one good thing when he created Rose Tyler. Before I go into what I didn't like about It's a Sin, I will say it wasn't the worst thing I've ever watched. I just found it a little tone deaf and empty given its semi-autobiographical nature and heavy content. The show was definitely well made, well shot, and I really enjoyed some of the performances. Neil Patrick Harris was a surprising highlight, even with the dodgy accent. I always enjoy Keely Hawes and Sean Dooley, and the gang in the Pink Palace were all pretty great. Nathaniel Curtis was highly underused, Callum Scott Howes is adorable, and Lydia West carried the entire series on her back. I hope she wins some awards for this. I also think the message of finding hope in the dark times is a good one, even if the rest of the show irritated me for other reasons. It's a Sin had a great way of showing how human closeness and love are the goals ultimately, and any life lived in pursuit of those things is a life well lived, no matter how it ends. I really liked Gloria's storyline and the scenes with Jill and the cup. Colin and his mother broke me and I do appreciate the depiction of some of the more gruesome elements of what it looks like to die of AIDS. Neil Patrick Harris's character and the lunch stuff was just hard to watch. The show was not necessarily malicious, but careless in a few aspects. And I don't want anyone to think that I've simply come to woke scold a show that had a positive message overall. That being said, I am a little over St. T. Davies and his descent from gay heaven every few years to bless British straights with a show that reminds them to stop killing and abusing queers en masse, as long as they fit into the rigorous, C, white, cis and male structure of what people like Davies seem to think queer looks like. It's a sin, unfortunately for it, is hard to see outside of Davies' previous work which has arguably always been pretty gay, but kind of diluted, even when it seemed raw. His shows are the kind of media that you watch with your mother when you first come out. The type of media made by gay people for straight people, to make gays look less threatening, overall. However, these shows tend to do very little for bi plus, trans or lesbian identified people. I personally, and again this is only me, I'm fine with this kind of television show in theory, but Davies has however made this type of show before and failed to achieve this purpose, to get any good message across, and all of his shows have arguably done more damage to the queer image on British TV than help it. One big complaint I have is Tracy Ann Oberman, Stephen Fry, really? Davies couldn't have picked two British people who better exemplify what is wrong with the liberal human rights movement, or lack thereof, in the United Kingdom right now. Tracy Ann Oberman, who you may recognise from this random episode of Doctor Who if you're not British, doesn't care about queer people. And if Tracy did care about queer people, she wouldn't have helped re-elect a Conservative Party into leadership. If she cared about pandemics, 
she wouldn't have helped hand power to the government that has the highest COVID death rate in the world. A Conservative Party that the UN found had violated people's human rights. The same Conservative Party that was in charge when the AIDS crisis happened. The same Conservative Party that brought in things like Section 28, a policy that tortured queer people across the country. A policy that was supported by not only our current Prime Minister, but our last one too. This woman sued a barrister for retweeting a negative article about her. I mean, Palestine has a growing number of HIV and AIDS cases. What about those people? Tracy? Stephen? Stephen Fry is also, like, way too okay with pederasty. His husband was, like, 26 when they met, and 30 years younger than him. He's so into the idea that old men should have young, pseudo-pubescent, man-baby boyfriends that when Stephen married his husband, they had a tiny plush Oscar Wilde watching them. Like, yeah, I guess Oscar Wilde was technically jailed for being gay, but he was also a nonce. He literally was part of some sort of international paedophile ring, and the boys he did rape were never okay afterwards. Maybe chill defending a child abuser. Having to watch Stephen Fry play a creepy old man who is using men in their 20s didn't feel like nuance, it felt like endorsement. Most older bisexual men aren't dirty, they deserve better representation than this, and pedestry should have died with the Greeks. This storyline happened twice in five episodes. This lacklustre approach to abuse upset me beyond belief, and I cannot believe I saw it with my own eyes in the year 2021. This is the most Lib Dem approach to television I have seen in a while, and I have no party alliance. Every political party in this country sucks. Don't come at me. Okay, I've got that out of my system. Let's actually talk about how this show chose to portray the AIDS epidemic. And more importantly, let me try and fill in some of the stories that weren't told. Stories that I think are just as important and worthy of telling as the story of a man that voted for his own oppression. Because ultimately, in my opinion, It's a Sin feels like its main message was the AIDS crisis was sad. And this is most obvious to me in the choice it makes to centre its narrative on the most privileged members of a community that was wronged, and when it chooses spectacle over substance. This is not me trying to say that white, gay, cis men cannot have these stories. They should, and I support that. I just think this particular story had room for more narratives than the one we had alone. That one story repeated. The story of an easier to digest white gay instead of others adapted. Nor am I here to argue that Russell T Davies actually hate gay people. I just think this adaptation was a little lazy, and perhaps that was because people were too close to the narrative they chose to tell. Fry actually has a documentary called HIV and Me, and it's easily found on YouTube and linked below. I don't like Stephen Fry, I feel like I've made that pretty clear. But the documentary tells some pretty varied stories, and I enjoyed it as much as one can a documentary about people dying. At the end of the day, this was a gay show made for a straight audience. And that is fine, I guess. But as I said, I want to talk about what Davies missed. Things I think he left out because he was being a little lazy. And things I completely understand why he left out, but I think people might want to know anyway. I'm queer, I have a blood disorder, I grew up outside of Brighton and I have opinions, so let's do this. Chapter 1. Women as Mothers in It's a Sin Testing about rights for lesbian and gay people. <laughs> Mrs McConville's one of those carriers. Laurie, how do you actually catch the AIDS virus in the first place, do you know? Yes, we shared dirty needles about three, four years ago. And in the Edinburgh area. And that's how I've caught it anyway. This woman has AIDS. She's a former drug addict. She's just 25 and doesn't know how long she's got to live. This woman was beaten senseless when other people in the squat heard her talking about having AIDS. She ended up sleeping in this car park. Young women, beaten senseless, ostracized and dying. It's like getting a death sentence, that's what it's like. And you're left just in nightmares. You don't want you're living in a nightmare. You know, since you murdered him, I, I, 
I know that's a strong word, but that's how me and all the other people in Tainted Blood look at it, because it's murder. It's just bloody murder. I know I shouldn't, but I get angry about it because they don't take a notice. I'm going to start with women and how they were portrayed within the narrative, both because I think they suffered some of the worst dismissals of the show, but also to get this kind of out of the way before I talk more exclusively about men. The women in this show did not have a nice time, and they tend to exist in two categories, mother slash caregiver, and goth lesbian background character with one line to remind you that it's the 80s. Oh, and there is also a lawyer who appears for five minutes. She's awesome, but she has no screen time really, and serves a white boy's plot entirely. The strange thing about the portrayal of women in It's a Sin is that a few of the female characters are based on the stories of real-life women. The aforementioned lawyer, being based accumulatively on the queer women who worked for AIDS charities back in the day, and the main character of Jill, who lives with the boys. The real Jill, being Davis's friend from back in the day, who used to spend a lot of time caring for people on AIDS wards and working in telephone centres. The woman who is playing Jill the character's mum is actually the real-life Jill. And of course, I have no issue representing the real women that were affected and involved with the AIDS epidemic. That's what I want. However, there is nothing but female caregivers in this show. I'm not sure how true to life this aspect of the story is, but It's a Sin covers almost a decade, and Jill is never seen having a friend or relationship outside of the gay men she lives with and cleans up after. That seems to be her only real storyline, at one point, there is also a joke about her looking like a man, which isn't relevant, but it kind of annoyed me, and it comes from another black character. It's not really overtly harmful, but it felt a bit cheap, coming from mostly white writers living in a civil rights era, making a piece of work on a civil rights issue. Throwing black trans women under the bus may seem like a nod to the good old days, but it kind of annoyed me. Jill is kind of hard to discuss outside of her mothering role. She wants to perform, and she is a performer, she has a job, but she seems to spend more time volunteering for HIV charities and on AIDS wards, and again, just literally making dinner for four fully grown men, than she does pursuing any part of her career. Which is fair, but it's a strange juxtaposition given that we see Richie, who gets into acting because of Jill, auditioning over and over and over again. I understand that the real Jill's life probably was derailed by the fact that all of her friends were dying, that she was probably consumed by the pandemic. However, within It's a Sin, Jill is more concerned with AIDS than anyone else. Her only personality point is f Jill is implied to be heterosexual, but she is presented as almost entirely sexless. It's also hard not to see that there were no queer women in the show. So I can't help but wonder, why wasn't Jill just queer? Like, yes, of course some straight women helped care for AIDS patients in the 1980s, when nobody else would, but most of these women weren't straight. It was bisexual and lesbian women who came out for their gay and bi and trans siblings when straight people had forgotten them. There are famous groups, like the Blood Sisters in the USA, and as Russell T Davis himself acknowledged in an interview I read, a lot of the nurses volunteering to work on AIDS wards in the UK, and physically deal with AIDS patients when nobody else would, were queer women. Two birds, one stone, dude. Queer women's trauma is definitely worth a few moments of screen time. Here is a quote from a lesbian nurse named Flick about her time working in wards with AIDS patients. Sometimes multiple people would die, she said. As a nurse, of a shift I would have, two live patients to look after, and two dead patients to look after, and that meant as nurses, we had to run the 12-bed mortuary. We had a viewing room that we used to set up. It was a nice room, that we were responsible for going down and getting the bodies out of the fridge, and putting them in a bed for their relatives and friends to come and visit and to sit around. That was pretty traumatic. Even if this sexless, miserable existence was wholly accurate to the real Jill's life, and I doubt it was ever that bad. It did not have to be the case for Jill the character. I definitely think Davies thought he was saying something with Jill having a life that was obsessively about caring for these boys. 
I'm just not really sure what it was. The other most prominent female character in the show is Keely Hawes' character, playing lead Richie's mother. She is also just a caregiver, to her whole family, but specifically to Richie, who she panders to in every way outside of accepting this queerness. And the show, instead of, I don't know, giving either of these women their own arc, has both of their arcs revolve around Richie and culminate together in a conversation they have in the last episode. This conversation perfectly encompassed what I disliked about the portrayal of the few women that did exist in the show. Spoilers, big final episode ones ahead. So the last episode of the season basically centres on Richie dying and how his family find out and react to his deathbed AIDS diagnosis. The episode also focuses a lot on the relationship and resentment between Jill and Valerie, Richie's mother, and this all comes to a boiling point after his death. They shout at each other about how one is neglectful and the other smothering, both essentially blaming the other for the fact that Richie got AIDS. Which, okay, that feels like quite a stand for the show to take, given that they had just shown us the episode before, that when Richie had learned of the risk of AIDS, he took said risk. Jill even goes on to say that he killed other men because of the fact he took that risk, but then continues to blame that decision on the homophobic shame brought on by his mother. They all die because of you. Valerie says that if she didn't see Richie, it was because Jill got in the way. This show's last big scene before curtain call is a screaming match between two women about whose fault it was that a fully grown man contracted AIDS. Perhaps his? Maybe the government that failed to educate people? That let some of the most vulnerable members of a society die because they were homophobic? People are products of their environments, and if Jill can acknowledge that in Richie, then I'm not sure why she can't recognise it in Valerie. Her homophobia, her blindness, her general being a piece of shitness, is a fair thing to call her out on. But that doesn't mean she is the personal reason her son caught AIDS. Also, Richie has two parents. This comment really worried me in terms of how much of a stance it feels like the writers take with it. Their thesis statement for It's a Sin is this speech that Jill gives, the one in which she basically blames homophobic Middle Englanders for the AIDS crisis. Sure, bad parenting was partly to blame for the AIDS crisis, but mothering and parenting are two very different things, and if Davies wanted a female figurehead to direct his anger at, Margaret Thatcher, the literal Prime Minister and perhaps devil, was there the whole time. She was literally in charge of the country when it was happening, and Richie voted for her because of his shitty upbringing. Chapter 2. Erasure and Exclusion in It's a Sin Queen said tonight they were planning a big musical event dedicated to their lead singer, Freddie Mercury, who died last night of AIDS. There have been tributes to his talent and his courage from friends and from fans. The health minister, Mrs Virginia Bottomley, predicted his death would have a big impact in preventing the spread of AIDS. Fans at his home in West London mourn the best-known British star to have died from the disease. Throughout the world, the news tonight, which we just uh, got as we came on air at the top of the hour, Freddie Mercury has died, the rock star lead singer of Queen. And the rock star Freddie Mercury has died, a day after he confirmed that he was suffering from AIDS. Freddie Mercury, who died last night? It's a Sin, by critical review standards, is doing pretty well. The great British public seems to like it, and it has been watched by large numbers, and reviewers have seemed to laud it as groundbreaking LGBT storytelling. And okay, enjoying the show is one thing, I have no issue with that, but good LGBT storytelling seems like quite a jump for a show that mentions bisexual people offhandedly twice, and queer women and trans people come in the form of background characters with the odd line but no arc, narrative or name. You cannot really call something LGBT anything when it disregards three of those letters. This story is about the predominantly white gay experience, not the LGBT one. Regardless of whether you think that's okay or not, it still remains factual. 
and I don't really think it's okay. Men of colour, bisexual men, queer women, trans people were all still really affected by the AIDS epidemic. Whether that be through personal infection or through having to watch all of your friends die. They were affected just as much as white cis male gays and yet they were all secondary players in a show about the AIDS crisis. They were either secondary characters to the white stories or plainly ignored. Roscoe and Ash both played less of a role in the overall sad AIDS narrative than Richie and Colin. Their stories seeming lesser in every sense. Ash is essentially reduced to the exotic stereotype that he feared Richie saw him in in the first episode, ending up worshipping a man that, one, voted for the Tories, again, yes, this character voted for Margaret Thatcher in canon, and I have to keep mentioning it, and two, doesn't deserve him at all. Roscoe's sidelining feels maybe worse, given that he is actually given main character status, like Richie and Colin, unlike Ash, but his story does not exactly hold the same empathic weight. It's honestly a waste of a storyline to focus on two small town gay white men who both die of AIDS and not the black man of African descent as closely as well. Like, Roscoe's story is there, but it's nowhere near as respected or delved into as the other two. The opening of the show really didn't leave me feeling great in regards to how the show had chosen to represent these storylines alongside each other, and in my opinion, the portrayal hardly got better from there. In the introduction of these three main characters, we see Colin, a fairly poor Welsh mummy's boy, moving to London to have the freedom to be gay without judgement. We see Richie, a middle class mummy's boy, moving to London to have the freedom to be gay without judgement. And we see Roscoe, moving out because his parents have already found out he is gay, unlike the other boys, and they are planning to send him back to Nigeria, where it would be easier to murder him because he is gay. His uncle is downstairs ready to put him on a flight, so his sister gives him all the money she has so he can run away. These stories are hardly comparable, even if they are all worthy queer narratives to tell, yet the show does literally compare them. Not only does it compare them, it seems to pay less attention to the fact that Roscoe's parents wanted to murder him than it does on Richie's dad wanting him to go into law instead of acting. The show vaguely, and very briefly, and with some weird racial stereotypes, does mention how AIDS has affected Africa, or assumably and more specifically Nigeria, the show uses these kind of interchangeably. And it does this in the form of Roscoe's uncle coming to see him ten years after trying to kidnap and murder him. They show us his uncle crying about how much worse it is over there, and that the AIDS crisis is what made him see the light and not want to murder queer kids anymore. The scene fell really flat, being that we don't see Roscoe's uncle for more than two scenes, one in the first episode and one in the last, and I totally kind of forgot who he was by the time this supposedly emotional scene came around. The weird play of Africa seeming like this strange far off land full of AIDS victims and dangerous men who will murder you is… not great either. I mean, Roscoe is specifically from Nigeria, and Nigeria alone is one of the most diverse countries on the continent, and wasn't even one of the continent's highest affected countries when it came to HIV infection rates in the 80s. Nor now. It was East Africa that was most affected. Nigeria is in the West. Roscoe's storyline just feels so underdeveloped and under-researched in comparison to that of his white friends or the characters that were based on real-life counterparts. I'm still not even sure what Roscoe's arc was supposed to be about, to be honest. He just kind of ends up being the sassy one that wears makeup in the end. The show's representation of bisexual men is lacking too, and glaring with it. It's invisible. Richie identifies as bisexual at the beginning of the first episode, but identifies as gay for the rest of the show and is only ever shown to be attracted to men. This is a clear nod from Davies to the bisexuality as a stepping stone thing, but he doesn't really address it or call Richie out for it, or even acknowledge bisexuality in any other way. The only other reference to bisexuality is this scene. Do you seriously think there's an illness that only kills gay men? It can calculate that you're gay and kill you, but no one else. Hmm. What about bisexuals? Do they only get sick every other day? Which, cool I guess. The erasure of bisexuality of bisexual men with a HIV diagnosis really pisses me off. It's one thing throwing queer women under the bus, we expect it at this point, but the show throws bi men and trans women away too. 
In a lot of the documentaries I watched while writing this, a lot of the papers, they all had this habit as well, of claiming that 80 to 90% of HIV diagnosis were given to gay men. This isn't true, not technically, and the wording matters. I mean, it's true enough in the sense that we are all gay, but when HIV patients were being recorded back in the 80s, most medical professionals didn't care enough about the difference between a gay man, a bisexual man, or a trans woman to record them as anything else. They were all just gay men. And this show may be set in the 1980s, but it wasn't written then, so Russell is well aware of this erasure if we're to assume that he did his research. He would see that a large proportion of those so-called gay men were actually bisexual. Bisexual men who were having safer sex with women than they were with men for some reason. Bisexual men that were blamed for the AIDS pandemic globally and still are to this day. The stigma carried by the bisexual community, by bisexual black men and bisexual trans people, that they are the spreaders of this deadly disease carried across the sea on sex holidays from countries full of savages, is still a prominent one. Only a few years ago was Christopher Biggins proclaiming on national television that it wasn't him or any of the other sweet gays that spread HIV, but instead it was the dirty bisexual men who were sneaking to Africa for gay sex and bringing it home to their wives. The phrase down low was literally created to scapegoat bisexual black men. The stigma around HIV and bisexual men gets them killed when it leaves them less likely than gay men to get tested for the virus. One of the essays I read on this subject, linked below, discussed the idea of the dead bisexual boyfriend, and how often, when AIDS cases were reported in women back in the day, those women would often be named and able to share their story in some public capacity. They often received the treatment needed to live with the disorder. More often than not, however, their dead bisexual boyfriend, who had also had the virus, remained unnamed, unseen, and, you know, dead. A very famous but very stupid gay studies sociologist by the name of Lord Humphreys is quoted in a 1987 edition of the New York Times, saying the following whilst discussing and categorising bisexuals. Humphreys describes the fifth category as ambisexuals, a small but dangerous group of men who have frequent sexual contact with both men and women. Basically, they don't care if a partner is a man or a woman, as long as that person is good-looking and sexually active, Dr. Humphreys said. I consider this group to be the most dangerous in the cross-infection of AIDS because these men are likely to be drug abusers as well, overlapping their high-risk behaviour. There was no proof for this. There still isn't. There is also no reason that any of these characters in this show couldn't have just been bisexual. Like, Ash gives me big bi vibes. To erase the narrative of the bisexual man, to reduce men of colour to side characters and queer women and trans people to extras, these are all choices made by the creative team behind the show. The most famous man in the UK, arguably in the whole world, to have died of AIDS in the public eye was Freddie Mercury, a bisexual Persian Brit born in East Africa. But sure, we need to cry over two white cis gay boys dying in this show. Everyone else simply serves them. Chapter 3. Government Responsibility in It's a Sin Now the rest of the news. The government is to ban the promotion of homosexuality in schools. Up to 17,000 people in England and Wales will die of AIDS in the next four years. Mr Anderton told a conference that people at risk were swirling around in a human cesspit of their own making. It could be said that the AIDS pandemic is a classic own goal scored by the human race on itself. It is the worst disaster in the history of the NHS. Who's to blame? Are they stupid or just incompetent? It's one or the other, isn't it? It's somebody's fault. Now, there are a lot of things about this show that I didn't love. But there are only a few things I truly hated. Most of them have to do with Stephen Fry's character. And the most egregious of all of these was the use of Margaret Thatcher as a joke. A piss joke, nonetheless. A flashback for my fellow cave dwellers. Margaret Thatcher was Conservative Prime Minister of Britain from 1979 to 1990, 
which means that throughout the entire AIDS epidemic in the UK, she was in charge. The Conservatives are a right-wing party and are currently in power in the UK under the leadership of Boris Johnson, a Thatcherite. Margaret Thatcher was, and I cannot overstate this, a murderer. For many reasons and many actions and many war crimes, but especially in relation to the AIDS crisis and the NHS blood scandal. Firstly, I'm just going to tell you what the blood scandal is, because I don't think a lot of people know about it, and how it relates to the AIDS crisis. And then I'm going to talk about how this show had no backbone in regards to making political statements. So not everyone who catches HIV, or at least caught it in regards to the UK epidemic that we're talking about, got it through IV drug use personally or through physical contact with the carrier. A lot of people infected with HIV and or hepatitis were infected by batches of contaminated blood signed off for use by the government. In the 1970s, the UK began importing blood from the US, both for the use in transfusions and in the form of a plasma-related drug used to treat haemophiliacs. Haemophilia is a genetic blood disorder that passes down the X gene and leaves sufferers with lower clotting levels. This means that if a young boy with haemophilia fell over, he would likely bruise and bleed beyond that of a typical child and would require a clotting agent or plasma injection to help the injury heal. Sometimes they don't even need to have accidents because a lot of bleeds are internal or spontaneous. Haemophiliacs are essentially squishy. In the 1970s, a new drug called Factor was created, and part of it was created by mixing American and British plasma together in one big pot. Then this plasma was given to the haemophiliac to help them clot. The UK has a blood donation system that replies on volunteering. There is no monetary benefit. However, in the US, you are paid for your donations. Whilst this means that America are easily able to access the amount of blood a country that size needs, it also means, for example, IV drug users with no income will donate in order to feed themselves and their habits. IV drug users in the US in the 80s, who were HIV or hepatitis positive, were donating blood that was then being given to patients in both Britain and the States. By the end of the decade and the beginning of the next, Doctors in America were beginning to see cases of haemophiliacs infected with HIV and hepatitis, and when this news passed to Britain, it was essentially ignored by anyone outside of Scotland with enough political power to stop it. So for over a decade, haemophiliacs who were coming to the NHS for help were often being infected by imported HIV and hepatitis. One of those men was my grandfather, who had haemophilia B and was infected with hepatitis C, alongside his brother, by the government. So yeah, I carry haemophilia, and if I ever have any biological children, they also have a chance of carrying or contracting the disorder. So this whole part of the epidemic tapestry can feel incredibly close to home. Especially considering my grandfather and uncle are both dead now, the hepatitis C having helped push that along, with neither of them seeing any real justice for the crimes done against them by the people who were charged with protecting them. It's also worth noting that I have been hovering in hemospaces since I was a child, and that I know people who were both infected with one of these viruses via bad factor, and who are also gay, so, like, you definitely could have done something with that, Russ. One of the worst cases of infection by the National Health Service is what happened at Trelaws College, a school for disabled children in England. This is one of the stories I don't necessarily think Russell needed to have included. I just think it's a story that tells you the scale of this problem, that being the infection rates in haemophiliacs, an infection rate that I do believe deserved more than a one-word mention. Trelaws College was a boarding school with a high population of boys with haemophilia, of whom almost 80 died from being infected from HIV and or hepatitis by a bad factor. The number of those infected with this disease was obviously much higher, and that's just one school. 80 dead children. Outside of the queer community, as well as haemophiliacs, the show also doesn't really address IV drug users, prisoners, or sex workers. Not that sex workers, IV drug users, prisoners, and haemophiliacs can't also be queer. That intersection could have been shown with any of these characters, just as one of them could have been bisexual or trans. 
IV drug users, prisoners, and sex workers were deeply affected by this crisis, and left to die just as much, regardless of their sexual orientation, race, or gender. The government's gay cancer panic didn't just misrepresent gay men and leave them exposed and undertreated, but it also meant that other groups that had higher numbers of HIV rates were just as ignored, because for a long time no one wanted to admit HIV could spread outside of gay populations. When they did, it was too late. The spread of HIV did not start because of homosexuals, but because of colonialism. Go figure. But no one was going to say that back in 1984. Men who have sex with men are of course the highest risk category for HIV infections in the UK, but they are not the only ones to suffer at high rates. Black women of African descent have numbers almost as high and are usually less likely to report having unprotected sex with multiple partners. I'm not expecting Russell T Davies to address all of this, but I definitely think there could have been some nuance within the show. Because this show, and I guess partly because of its semi-autobiographical nature, does tend to ignore all the people who were affected by HIV and AIDS that were not gay men. Which, I guess, like I said, is fine. That's the choice that Davies has made, but I still think it's a little disappointing. There was no reason any of the things, any of the people or identity groups that I have brought up in this video couldn't have been represented for five minutes. I don't care if Russell T Davies said he had no time. He had like 30 sex scenes and more shots of Ollie from years and years looking at butts than should be humanly possible. If you have time for that much butt, you have five minutes to respect lesbians, or sex workers, or bisexuals, or black people, Oh. My. God. It also really doesn't help reinforce the whole this wasn't a gay cancer, this was political incompetence message. If everyone dies of gay cancer anyway, and no one really spends any time in the show calling out the government officials who knew this was happening years before people started dying en masse. Neither is there any recognition for the older queers who appear in the first few episodes, trying to warn the younger ones about how HIV is infecting their population. This show doesn't really make any overtly political statements. It's kind of politically confusing. Frankly dismissive of the murderous policies that caused such a humanitarian crisis. Again, Margaret Thatcher literally appears in this show on screen and the scene is used to embarrass bisexuals and make a piss joke. There is no way not to see that as a waste of screen time and honestly a waste of my time. They talk about how Richie voted for the Tories and he thinks gay sex is too much for kids to know about, but like, no one ever actually addresses why that is ironic or an issue. Unless you include Jill shaming Richie's mother in the last episode, blaming her personal homophobia for the AIDS crisis. Which I don't. To pass over to another HBO series from the last few years that focused on a disaster caused by a political incompetence, Craig Mazin's and Johan Rank's Chernobyl. Chernobyl, in my opinion, was better than its sin, and not because Chernobyl had a bigger budget or better effects or the more spectacle of a story, simply because Chernobyl made a statement and it kept to it, and then it did everything it could to relay that statement to its audience. Chernobyl, the nuclear accident, was murder. The show makes this statement in its first scene very clearly, and in its last. There were far greater criminals than him at work. And as for what Dyatlov did do, the man doesn't deserve prison. He deserves death. The series also finished with not only an in-universe court-style episode, which informed the audience of the hows and whys of the Chernobyl disaster they had just watched, but it also finished with a factual end reel playing out the end of the show after credits, with an informative video about the Chernobyl disaster and the real-life people represented in the show, the real victims of this crisis. It showed us how and where accountability was taken, and where it wasn't. There was no misunderstanding who was at fault in Chernobyl. Those damn red capes trying to beat the Americans to nuclear supremacy. The people on top, who were willing to risk the lives of people at the bottom in order to accumulate money and power. It's a sin makes the responsibility more personal, saying that the acts of the individual who ignored the AIDS pandemic are why the AIDS pandemic happened. 
even though that explanation is simple at best and false at worst. There were so many officials, doctors and politicians who knew about the incoming pandemic before 1980 and did nothing about it. This problem is systemic, not personal, and that is the message I think Chernobyl was much better at getting across. Conclusion Again, I didn't want to just make another video just complaining, and I didn't want to make this video to simply have a go at my older queers who were trying to portray their story. But this still felt like half a story sometimes. It's a sin felt done before, a queer story where some queer narratives held value and others didn't. It was a show that, for me, felt like it had very little to offer in regards to being educated on anything new in regards to the AIDS crisis. I didn't learn anything new, and honestly, I think I learned more about the AIDS crisis by being a renthead at 13. AIDS was sad, yes, that's true. People were misinformed, that's also true. Queer men were left to die, definitely a fact. But whose fault was that? Why did it happen? Being someone whose family was quite literally infected by the government, being someone who doesn't want to blame overbearing conservative mothers and uneducated gay men for society's downfalls. I'm just going to blame the people in charge, the people at the top. And I kind of wish It's a Sin had done the same, that It's a Sin had taken these sad stories and shown them with an eye towards the future, not one simply focused on just relaying the past, a portrayal which lacks reflection on a societal level. I mean, we literally live in times of pandemic and illness right now, and it really doesn't matter how many Karens don't wear a mask if their government doesn't attempt to control the virus crossing the border. It's a sin understood shame, and that I appreciate, because that definitely is a big part of why HIV travelled around the gay community so rapidly. But that shame was systemic, enforced by politicians who stood up in representation of our great palace of democracy and said things like this. Children who need to be taught to respect traditional moral values are being taught that they have an inalienable right to be gay. All of those children are being cheated of a sound start in life. Yes, cheated. 